Tonight we've got uh, Dr. Stephen Hughes, who's here as part of the Fulbright program and um, with the University of Auckland. Uh, he's been here for a couple of weeks, isn't it, Stephen? Doing a little bit of work with uh, Colin, who's uh, sitting, sitting next to chap here. And um, I guess, interestingly enough, um, he, he's going to be talking to us about some of the coastal engin engineering challenges that are going to be happening in the future. Um, and he's made the wise decision to move to Colorado, which is um, 1,500 metres <laughs> above sea level. <laughs> and I'm sure Stephen will appreciate that. That's about the fourth time I've told that joke to him tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> he'll be able to be sick of it right now. Um, anyway, um, step up to the mic. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to try to speak loud. So if anyone in the back's having difficulty, raise their hand, and I'll try to raise my voice a little bit to make myself heard. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Coastal Society for putting this event on, and it's particularly a pleasure to be speaking to practitioners of coastal engineering. I had a career in research, but I really considered myself a practicing engineer. In fact, Colin will tell you that the, one of the taglines on my emails uh, refers to engineering as the duct tape of science because we, we sort of take science and, and make practical use of it. So about 54 years ago, Bob Dylan penned a song, a little bit uh, maybe looking into the future about the waters around us rising, but, but he got it right, the times are changing. And what we're seeing today is a new awareness of climate change, sea level rise, and how that's going to impact those of us who live around the coast. So today, I, I want to talk a little bit, look sh briefly into the past, uh, give you some of my observations of what's going on now, and bear in mind that all of this comes with my own bias and prejudice, so take it with a grain of salt, it's opinion more than anything else. And then, then discuss perhaps what might be some challenges for coastal engineers, coastal practitioners, coastal scientists. First, a brief look into the past. A number of years ago, MP O'Brien, uh, who was dean at Berkeley and one of the real fathers of coastal engineering in the United States, uh, listed what some of his concerns were in 1972. And they're listed up here. I don't know if you can read it from the back, but he, he felt we needed more input from practicing engineers. He was, said we were maybe too optimistic about advances that we saw that worked at one site being transferable to other coastal locations. He, he saw long-term data collection at sites as being a problem. He really advocated regional studies. We don't just take a pocket and work there. We have to consider what's happening updrift, downdrift, and around the bend. Uh, he, he thought experimental work, neglected to collect a lot of data that they could. Uh, he really advocated interdisciplinary teams. Uh, he thought there wasn't enough wave data, and of course we're, we're doing better at a lot of these, and a need for more case failure, case studies of failures. In uh, my opinion, three of these are still really need some attention. The inputs needed from practicing engineers, uh, the teams that involve different scientists, the geologists, the geotechnical engineers, coastal science, the ecologists, and whatnot, and then a reporting of, of what works and what doesn't work. So some of my observations about the pres present, and I might preface this by saying that my entire research career was largely involved laboratory work and physical models, so I have a real endearment to those, and I've paid attention to what's going on, and so some of that will be reflected in my comments. So what are the trends in research publications? Uh, several years ago, I, I looked at the Coastal Engineering Journal by Elsevier, uh, primarily because it's strictly coastal engineering, it's highly regarded, and I wanted to see what the trends were from present day to what they were 20, 25 years ago. So I, I looked at a uh, 109 papers that appeared in the journal in 2013, and I went back 20 years and looked at 108 papers, 
And, and I guess the first comment is I had to look at three years of the journal 20 years ago as compared to now. So there's a lot more publications out there. And it's hard for, for both researchers and practitioners to keep up with the literature these days because you don't know what's important and what's just kind of a churn by the people in the academic community in order to get their publications up. So what I did is by reading the abstracts of these papers, I tried to categorize the main research approach, whether it was a numerical modeling paper, primarily, a laboratory study, a field study, a case study, a theoretical study, or a desk study, which might be kind of like a literature review or an empirical formulation based on data or whatnot. And keep in mind, this is uh, pretty subjective and not very scientific. And, and if anybody in this room looked at the same set of papers, they might come up with a different result. So here, here is the result. The, the green bars represent the more modern papers from 2013. And the blue hashed are, are what we had 20 years prior to that. And when you look at that, you don't see too much of a different change. The, uh, there's been a few more numerical modeling papers, but surprisingly, there's also been a few more laboratory-based papers. Where you really see change is in the death studies. There's been less of those. And the small amount in the field and the case study, those are the, the shorter bars right in the middle of the plot. So I would, I would say that just this kind of unscientific look, to me, indicates that despite what people say, laboratory work has not died. It's not dying off. It's not being killed off by numerical modeling. And, and besides the publication of high, of high quality research that involves laboratory work, in Europe, particularly, there's construction of new and very impressive laboratory facilities. Here's an example of the new delta flume, which can generate waves up to two meters in height. And this is the opening ceremony. And, and I know the engineer that programmed that wave specifically so it would splash the dignitaries. <laughs> and I have to take my hat off to him. Uh, here's a new facility in Edinburgh, the university there that's pretty impressive. And even closer to home, University of Auckland's got new hydraulic facilities in Newmarket. So it's, uh, you know, despite the, the claims that physical modeling is a dying field, I, I don't really think that's the truth. There's been some pretty innovative things. You may not be able to see the photographs from where you are, but there's using a release of water to simulate wave up, up running on a grassy slope. And over on the right, you'll see a, a big container that's held up by a tractor, and it releases water to simulate a wa breaking wave that comes over and hits the slope to see the resiliency of the grass slope. So there's some new techniques going on. At Colorado State University, uh, our big, biggest facility is this full-scale wave overtopping simulator. And it's a large container that holds 28 cubic meters of water at full capacity. And that's released all at once down a grass slope to look at the resiliency. It was built specifically for the redesign of the New Orleans levees after Hurricane Katrina uh, caused so much damage. So I, I claim that laboratory still plays a critical role. We confirm coastal designs and everything I've been involved in, the savings, the cost savings you get from doing a laboratory study of a project, usually several times over the savings or several times over the cost of doing the model. We develop imperial guidance in, that you use in your day-to-day -day designs. It's useful for numerical model development and verification of those numerical models. And in fact, if we go back at these papers that I discussed, and looked at the 32 papers that were sort of primarily numerical model papers from 1991 to 1993, 54% of them contained laboratory data, either for validation of the model or for providing the missing parts that the <coughs> physics were missing, and you had to supply it with some empirical relationships. And that really hasn't changed for the 41 papers that appeared in 2013. 
So my conclusions about the importance of laboratory work is, first of all, there's no simplification of the governing physics. And an interesting story, a fairly famous coastal engineer that worked at our lab in numerical modeling came out to observe one of the, the basin models I was running, and he was having trouble with his code with the nonlinear terms. And so they have a mechanism to turn those off and just run the linear terms while they get a solution. He says, well, do you have the nonlinear terms turned on? And I said, I don't have any way to turn them off. So, so we get the entire physics there. Uh, the laboratory models contribute to the development of numerical model advances. I maintain universities cannot afford to neglect this because it's a great teaching tool because of the visual feedback it gives. The brain is a great analog computer and you can bring lay people that have never seen a particular process in and show them something and they're able to immediately see what's going on and actually, actually say, well, I bet this happens next when we do it. And I like to tell the story that so many times I've gone into a study with a preconceived notion of what I was going to see. And you turn the model on for the first time and you see something entirely different. Of course, when I write up the report post-experiment, I never, never mention my lack of insight, but, but it's there. Uh, talk a little bit about numerical modeling processes, and I have to qualify it that I'm not a numerical modeler but I really appreciate the advances and the utility that we've seen over the last 20 years in numerical models of what you can do. Uh, a number of years ago, Professor Batches, I don't know if you're familiar with the name, but he's another one of the giants in coastal engineering. He commented about numerical modeling of coastal processes, and he saw that there was an increasing complexity of the models and the range of applications of what you could do with the models. He felt there was always a need for wave phase averaging models. These are the models that give you a wave spectrum rather than a wave by wave. And then the phase resolving models, like a Boussinesque model that gives you each wave. And he saw a need for both of them, but he thought there was a prolif prol proliferation of the models, particularly the wave phasing models. And I think this is because the people developing, developed almost a, a parenting relationship with their model and, and, and they, they hold it very close and, and their model's better than anyone else's and, and they'll argue that and whatnot. And he was kind of skeptical about the added value of having all these models. And the last point, he said the preference is for a minimum number of wave models in an organization that give acceptable results at a reasonable cost. And this is particularly relevant for a consulting firm. You don't want to have a bunch of different models that give different results. You want one or two or three models that give good results and you've got a lot of experience and practice using them. You know where the problems lie with the models. Uh, you know when you can apply them, when you can apply them. And, and because of that, the results you get are going to be more reliable and you're not going to find yourself in trouble or, or being being protested by someone because of that. Uh, the users of numerical model, and that's usually in a consultancy, you don't have the people who develop the models, you have people that have gone to a workshop and have learned how to use the models and have started to apply them in a, in a project. And you really have the responsibility to understand what physical process or processes are included in the model. And that doesn't mean knowing what equation was there and, and how they they treated the, the differential terms and what sort of numerical scheme was using. You just have to understand what physics are included, what physics have been left out, perhaps, and, and understand that if they're left out, then they must not be important. But are they really? You need to think about that. It's really important to adhere, adhere to the model limitations and understand the input requirements and then, then, when necessary, do a careful calibration and verification of the model. If you do that, then, then you're not going to have any problems. You'll have a successful project, and, and you'll have something that's reliable. Developers of numerical models mainly must maintain fidelity to the physics of fluids. There's no other way around it. Uh, you need to document the known shortcomings and workarounds that you've had to do. 
in the model, uh, provide unbiased model val validation. That's sometimes kind of difficult to get from the developers. And when possible, test models to cases with analytic solutions. And a good friend of mine, Rod Sobey, at the University of Berkeley was once contracted because they wanted him to evaluate numerical model proposals for San Francisco Bay. And he said he wanted them to run the model with no input for X, X amount of time. Because if the model was not correctly put together with the physics, you'd all of a sudden start to see motions. Numerical errors would creep into that. You know, he wanted to see it that the model could run for a long time and not produce anything because it wasn't being driven. A couple of the people with proposals pulled out when they saw some of his requirements. And then provide uh, model application guidance and limitations so the models aren't applied outside their, their applicable range. Some of the positive trends I've noticed is some open sourcing of the numerical codes. And this is good because it brings communities together. You get a variety of people that are uh, contributing to the model. A community grows up around that. You have user groups that share their experiences. And because of that, the models sort of expand in their applicability and their reliability. And so it appears that several models have become de facto standards in terms of wave propagation, uh, tidal currents, uh, surges, tsunamis, or whatever. And, and I think that's a, a good development. Areas of growth for coastal engineering. I think marine energy is uh, starting to raise its head. And there's been a lot of research in that area. Uh, I'd like to see that continue. Addressing environmental problems. When I worked with the Corps of Engineers, it wasn't until the, until the latter part of my career that we even saw uh, a consideration of some of the environmental problems. And now, I think it's front and center for any projects that you might propose. You have to consider that. Uh, at least in the United States, and I suspect here in New Zealand as well, a lot of the infrastructure is established and probably starting to age. And so issues like maintenance of existing infrastructures and adapting existing structures or infrastructure to sea, to sea level rise and climate change are going to become issues. There's always the needs of the oil and the shipping industries in coastal engineering. And we, we always like a better understanding of the, of the fundamental processes. I've added litigation here, but that's probably more of a US-centric uh, thing than other, other places. We have a, a lot of lawyers, and lawyers are hungry. and. Uh, <clears throat> So now on to the challenges for coastal engineering. And once again, my biases enter into this topic. And it, you may think there's other challenges that are uh, somewhat different than these. But the uh, first one I wanted to, to address was responding to climate change. And I don't think that's even a, an elephant in the room anymore. <clears throat> Everybody's aware of it. We know that. <clears throat> It's going to have to be addressed. And so on the left shows a photograph of a, a seashore community in New Jersey just right after Hurricane Sandy. And one year later, everything's been rebuilt. So is that wise? Most of the people in this room would say perhaps not. But, but as coastal engineers, we need to sort of become more vocal. We have to let our opinions be known and warn people of what's happening. So responding to climate change, we have rising sea level. They're projecting more frequent and more severe storms, damaging so storm surges, uh, eroding beaches. Uh, coastal habitats are going to be affected by this. And, and then we have to think about upgrading our aging infrastructure for Port Harbor commerce. Probably the ones that affect coastal engineering most are rising sea levels and the intensity of the storms. A good friend of mine, John Hedlund, uh, wrote a paper, and he gave, listed some of the uncertainties about climate change and said, given that we don't know exactly what's going to happen, that, that our science should be objective, transparent, and accurate. And that's becoming harder to do because we've reached a time in, in our history where strongly held opinion 
sometimes carries equal weight to scientific fact, unfortunately. It's sort of the, there's a book out there that's actually called The Death of Expertise. So if you've got a large enough megaphone, you can make your opinion hear, heard, and, and science is kind of pushed to the back. So my daughter wears a sweatshirt that says, science doesn't care what you think. And I, I sort of subscribe to that as well. So we need science-based dialogue about practical management solutions. And we, and we should caution about overreaction. There's a lot of hype with the 24-hour media cycle now. They've got to talk about something, and it's uh, bad news and, and blood makes the front page. So we, we need to be careful about that. Hedlund <coughs> also pointed out that sea level rise is probably what we can predict the best. So we ought to start there and make predictions about sea level rise and then worry more about where, what we might see in terms of, of changes to the frequency and veracity of the storms. They asked 90 sea level rise experts to give their best estimate of what they thought the global sea level rise would be over the year 2100, assuming that nothing's done to abate the, the spilling of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that's causing the climate change, according to scientists. And, and surprisingly, the largest number of them picked just over a meter or so of, of sea level rise. And that's, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot when you think about it. How does that affect uh, some of the major coastal cities? Some of the cities with the highest annual flood costs are, are listed there. And that's all projected to increase by the year 2050. What's a little more surprising is look at cities that don't really have a problem right now that will have a flooding problem in uh, 50 years or so because of sea level rise. And they're shown there. There's a real cluster of them in the Mediterranean. It's, you can't read them from back in the back of the room. So how do we as an engineering community, a coastal sciences community respond? We have to think about how to incorporate climate change into our designs. You know, for years and years, you would pick a design event. Uh, you would pick a life time for your structure, and you would design to that without any consideration of sea level rise. The Corps of Engineers, finally, in the United States is now having that as a mandatory part of the consideration of design. One problem is we're used to sort of having stable estimates of annual exceedance probabilities for wave climate. That's because it was considered sort of almost a stable ergodic process. But that's no longer the case. And what used to be a 100-year design event, which has a 1% or a 1 chance of exceedance every year, might all of a sudden become a 25-year event. So you've got infrastructure out there that was designed to withstand these storms, but now the storms are becoming stronger and more frequent, and you have to deal with that. That involves retrofitting of existing projects and infrastructure, and more costly projects if you have to design something that, that has to withstand something that's coming in the future, not something that you expect right now. And part of that problem is convincing the funding sources of the project value. So as engineers, we need to become more vocal and, and better at, at explaining this. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So the second challenge I wanted to talk about is maintaining the knowledge base. It's real important for engineers. I think one of our real values is, is the ability to do critical thinking. And right behind that, I sort of rank knowing where to look it up. That's an important part of being a practicing engineer is knowing the right place to go to get your information. So we're fortunate that we do have some, some design manuals that have been put together. It's really kind of the consensus of the research community of what's important, and the practitioners have input to it. And so you've got these manuals, a European overtopping manual, the rock manual, the International Levy Handbook. And what these do is they provide a standard of care for engineers. A famous engineer from Hawaii once told me about the old shore protection manual that some of you uh, 
people may be familiar with in the new Coastal Engineering Manual that that was important for him because it established the standard of care that he had as a consultant. If he got involved in any litigation, he could go back and said, yes, this is the design guidance I use. This is acceptable design guidance. You have a little more problem going to the latest research paper that has a new formula, being able to justify that in your coastal design and defending it because it hasn't been vetted and incorporated into the manuals. So we need to be continually updating this standard design guidance to include the new information and remove the outdated methodologies. I've encountered a number of projects that involve large consulting firms that didn't particularly have coastal expertise. So they assigned someone, they went out, and they picked up the first thing they saw. And it was 40 years old and outdated by much newer research, published research, and it's included in the manuals. So we need to get rid of it in order to maintain the highest standards. We need to have wide availability of this, and, and maybe we need a central repository for the guidance uh, worldwide. So we, we might want to advocate for that sort of thing. And even perhaps even a wiki component where people can add on new stuff, but you need to take it with a grain of, th of salt. But at least it's available to look at. Another problem that's sort of related is disappearing data. And I found a, an interesting study that looked at a data avail availability for 516 papers uh, published over a 20-year span. And what they found was that the data were available almost entirely for the first two years after publication. But after that, the odds of attaining the data from the author dropped pretty rapidly, 17% for every two years. And the odds of, of having a working email to contact one of the lead authors or secondary author to try to obtain the data, that fell off very rapidly. And at the end of 20 years, 80% of the data were really lost. Now, over, over my 30-year career, I collected a lot of laboratory data. And I still maintain an old 486 computer that can read five and a half inch floppy disks because that's where some of the data is. But I know that I've lost some of it already as well. Uh, the reasons for it, uh, invalid email addresses, obsolete storage formats. How many of you still have zip drives hanging around? Yeah. Uh, poor record keeping, and, and some researchers are perhaps unwilling to share their data. I know every time I put something out there, there's that feeling in the back of your mind, what if I made a mistake and someone points that out and I'm totally embarrassed, but you really need to, to get over that and put it out there anyway, so I have. Some of the suggestions, are, uh, and some of the journals are doing this, are, are really encouraging people who publish to also make their data available. Uh, it could become mandatory publication. Certainly the funding agencies have the, the hammer to force you to make your, your data available and have uh, strong retention policies as well. On a personal note, uh, I'm afraid of what they're called the digital dark ages. <coughs> we now have uh, in the old days, you had film cameras, you got prints made, everything's digital now. My daughter's probably got gigabytes of photographs, and if her, her computer were to fail and she didn't have backup, it's all gone. Uh, down in our basement, we have photographs with thousands, or albums with thousands of photographs, and so I took it on myself to go and scan 600 of what I thought were the most important photographs from my kids growing up. And I printed two books and gave them to them. So they have that now. They don't have to mess with it when we're gone. And I said, oh, jeez, mom and dad, why'd you leave us all this crap? Now, they've got the important stuff gathered up. And I put together a family history because my father had saved photographs of his grandparents and whatnot. That's the little baby, it's me and my father, grandfather, great-grandfather. So that's kind of my solution for this, uh, involving that. But a lot of, of what's important is in a digital format these days, and you need to be thinking of how you're gonna constantly protect that. 
So there's also a related issue with disappearing publications. Uh, libraries are discarding their printed journals and they're going more online now. And, and a friend of mine says, well, what happens if that publisher goes out of business? All of a sudden, you've got 50 or 60 years of, of digitized journals in PDF format, and their website's all of a sudden not available. You can't get those anywhere. Conference proceedings now are only issued on thumb drives or CDs. On my bookshelves, I've got 30 years of conference proceedings but I bet I can't tell you where the thumb drive is from the conference I went to two years ago that has all the papers in it. Uh, there's sometimes they change the electronic format. So some of the suggestions are long-term web-based web publications or repositories for the conference and workshop proceedings, and then making sure that the journal publishers stay in business. Uh, in the United States, the, uh, <coughs> a, the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association uh, put out a little white paper that, that talked about eroding expertise in coastal engineering and listed some reasons for this. This included reduced research funding, uh, fewer coastal projects, so there was less learning opportunities for the, for the people, a retirement of experts without adequate mentoring, when I left my laboratory, I don't think anybody ever picked up the work that I was doing, and I'm partially to blame for that. Uh, contracting seems to be in favor of the larger firms, and they may not necessarily have the sp specific expertise, so they have to go out and find, it, uh, find a subcontractor. A reduced number of engineering graduates in the coastal field, and then a loss of laboratory and testing capabilities. And, and once again, this is more US-centric, I think, than other where, where I, I see a very strong, proactive group in, in, in Europe and hopefully here in New Zealand as well. I sometimes harp about fewer generalists. You get someone who goes through a degree and they, they sort of burrow down into a very specific topic and then they graduate and it interests them and they've become an expert in it and they burrow down further and they become the world's ranking expert. But they're kind of oblivious to other things that go into the project as well. And unless you're in a multidisciplinary integrated team and can learn about the other issues, uh, you're sort of in a stovepipe and isolated. And I don't think that's a good thing. So I'm, I'm, I encourage people to try to become generalists. Generalists are the people who sort of work down in the areas where the circles overlap. And you can have a certain amount of expertise in one field, but you need to create an awareness of the peripheral issues as well so you can, you can work around that. I think the people who lead the consulting companies, who lead the design teams, they're probably good generalists, and I encourage more people to do that. If you go to a technical conference, kind of move out of your comfort zone, and go into adjacent sessions about topics that you're not familiar about, just so you can gain a little bit of understanding of what other people's issues are. It'll really pay off in the long term. Uh, talking about advocacy for coastal engineering, some of the issues that we might want to talk about are the increasing coastal needs, particularly when we have a rising sea level, uh, the decreased Project funding, this is going to just kind of deteriorate away unless we maintain it. Uh, public education of the project value. Navigating the politics, which we all hate. If you're an engineer, you'd rather sit at your desk and do the fun stuff and, and not go out and, and do that. And, and unified efforts as well. Uh, Bob, Bob Weigel from Berkeley, who is another one of the founders of Coastal Engineering, he was commenting on a technical problem once at a, a public meeting, and he said it's really a complicated issue. And he was cut short by an ex-congresswoman. He says, that's the trouble with you engineers and scientists. You're always saying it's complicated. And so Professor Weigel's takeaway was the crux of the matter needs to be communicated in an understandable way. And what's worked for me is if I have something that's kind of technical that I want to explain lucidly, I'll explain it to my wife or to my kids. 
and then ask them to tell me what they heard. And if they understood it properly, then I know I'm communicating it well. I've, I've dropped the jargon, I've dropped any, any kind of technical things, and it's, it's really hard to do sometimes. Finally, the thing that's really important to me, and I think to you too, is learning from practitioners. Uh, really, the consulting firms, the practitioners, that's the face of coastal engineering. That's what people see, and the projects and the response to the projects, that is really what characterizes coastal engineering. It's not what's done in the research labs, it's not what's done in the universities, it's what's done, put in the ground, the, right out there where people can see it. So the, the advances that we've gotten from practice are really underrepresented in literature, and they're probably primarily in the field and the case history stuff. And why is that? And, and you know the answer to this as well as I do. Uh, you don't have time to publish and present your work because you finish a project, you're off on the next project, or you're behind on a project. Uh, there's no incentive to publish. Those in academia have an incentive because part of their promotion up the ladder involves number of publications in prestigious journals. So they, they need to do it. The journals tend to focus less on case studies, and, and I think that's their fault, and I think they're trying to do something about that. But you write a, a case study paper, and it goes to the editor, and he'll send it out to the reviewers, and a lot of the reviewers say, I'm not even interested in reviewing this because it's not nitty-gritty technical, you know, it's practical. So that's, that's a problem with the reviewers. I once organized a, a conference called Coastal Engineering Practice, and rather than 15-minute papers, we gave the speakers 30 minutes, because a lot of the projects you do are complicated and interesting, and in order to really bring it across, you need more time to talk about it. It was a successful conference, that it, and everyone who attended really enjoyed it, but the academics didn't attend it, the researchers didn't attend it, because it wasn't talking about things that interest them. And I think the practitioners have been really good seeking out researchers to get information, but I don't think that the opposite is true. I don't think the researchers go to the practitioners and say, you know, what's important here? Uh, what kind of things ought we be working on to make your job better, to make the, the infrastructure better? And finally, there might be business competition. If you go out and you do a really innovative project, and it's successful, and maybe you got a few secrets about what you did. You don't want to tip your hand. Hold those cards a little close and, and, uh, and, and milk that as long as you can, I think. So some suggestions. I think we really need practitioner input to define research direction. And if you think all the way back to Dean O'Brien's issues in 1972, he had the same comment. So that's still hanging out there, and so any of you Colin's right here, John's right here, bend their ear later on over a beer and say, you know, you really ought to be thinking about this. And you'll probably spark something in their mind and say, that's a good idea. We need more practice-oriented specialty conferences. You know, once again, uh, I, I think you probably do that with some of your coastal society meetings. You get together and you talk about things, so that's good. I advocate inviting practitioners into the classroom, uh, particularly for undergraduate engineers, engineering students. A lot of them are going to graduate and, and go out into the workforce, and they need to kind of know what's expected of them and what they're getting into and what kind of interesting things they can work on. And that may help them really settle in on coastal or civil engineering as a career. There should be incentives for publishing case studies and lesson learned papers, and publicize successful projects, uh, not only within your own organization, but, but other magazines. Try to find general interest magazines and write articles that are written with the idea that you're just you're talking to your next door neighbor and telling them what you're doing, rather than talking to someone who sits across from you in the office. So we're coming to the end here, and I've sort of relisted the things we've talked about. I know there's kind of a little bit of overload. Uh, 
The biggest challenge will be response to coastal climate change and what that involves. It's the most technically challenged in problems, but I, I have full confidence that our profession will be able to conquer that. Maintaining the do knowledge base, advocating for coastal engineering, and learning from the practitioners, I think that's going to require a champion to step forward or a couple of champions to take the reins and sort of push on this. You know, but once again, even though these are challenges, challenges bring opportunities. And we may not even know what these opportunities are yet, but when they appear, you need to be ready to, to capitalize on that. So I want to thank you once again uh, for this opportunity. It's been a real pleasure, and I'm really enjoying New Zealand. And go All Blacks, right? <laughs> All right, so yeah, uh, big thanks, Dr. Hughes. Um, you got time for a, a couple of few questions? Absolutely. Sure. Oh, well, seeing how I've got the chance to, to, to roll the roost and step in the limelight, I've got one off the bat. Um, you were talking about the importance of practitioners and um, learning from practitioners out there. I, I mean, I guess a lot of time I've spent in the field um, was in a, an area just north of Auckland in Rodney where we had an array of well, seawalls of sorts, ranging from tractor chassis to literally batteries, car batteries, um, and and everything sort of in between. And, and there were a lot of the times one of the things that I noticed was these structures were designed in an ad hoc manner and not to what you describe as um, standard engineering procedure. A lot of times, no geotextile there, but the things had been there for 30, 40, 50 years and were standing a, a range of storms. Um, do you think there's a, a sense of conservatism built into the, the engineering parameters that are there that perhaps could um, be tweaked moving into the future and some of the challenges that we're, we're going to be facing? I think it's an engineering trait to be conservative if you don't have an exact answer or you're, you're feeling a little bit of insecurity about it. Of course, if you're in a consultancy, you've got to be careful about that because the exposure, and, and you know this much more than I do, that uh, liability insurance is, is costly and you don't want to make mistakes. Uh, your reputation, future job prospects depend on you being able to do successful projects. So uh, if, you, if you do deterministic design as opposed to probabilistic design where you have a variety of, of designs that you can give and, and you tell the client or customer, you know, what level of risk are you willing to accept? That's, you need to be able to advise them as well because that's a whole new arena for them. They're not, they're not accustomed to, to getting risks. Usually you design to a single design event and if it fails before that des design event reach, reaches, then it's on you because that's a design failure. If it fails, if the design event is exceeded, then that's a, a, a design event of failure. And it's, it's, you did your due diligence, yeah. but th that's just the way nature is. So I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah. No. Uh, open it up. Oh, down the back. So well, I've just been doing Wellington for the design, uh, design challenge. And one of the key messages out that was we had a bunch of people from Midway and looking for climate change rainfall, for example. Um, a lot of people had various data sets, but being able to do predictions on future rainfalls were, uh, was being hampered by the access to, like, between Midway and Met Service and you know, various organisations just not being able to get the data into the science community. And then one of the other challenges that we saw was how do we, how do they inform this engineering community? Um, that, and you know, talking about the things, it's a similar message that you were uh, talking about today. Um, a couple of years ago, I was looking at a Pacific facility and you know, what was our design storm? Tropical cyclone, 14 meter waves. And, and that year there was a number of reported waves from 18 and 19 metre height. Mm -hmm. Should our 
what should our design criteria for, for protecting this specific facility be? And just trying to match the design facility, facility um, and how to protect that versus various practical science, uh, what our data models were saying. And you know, thank you for your question. Yeah, it's so it's not a question, but it's just a question. Well, well, it is a moving target. And and uh, there was an interesting book that, that I gave another talk on called Coasts in Crisis. And they, they start to list the monetary losses that have been experienced just in the last five to 10 years, not only in the United States, but in, in other places. And it's just staggering in terms of the millions of dollars of loss. So when the Corps of Engineers rebuilt the levee system in New Orleans, it cost them 44 billion New Zealand dollars. You can do a lot with forty-four billion. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know that's just a, the start. It's going to get worse. Jerry, I was, I was thinking back to your um, uh, image that you showed there of the rebuild after Hurricane Sandy, and you know it all looked very nice and suburban. Could have been in the middle of a country anywhere, but what, what's the um, insurance company's take? Well, the U.S. has something called the National Flood Insurance Program, and that insures properties that the insurance companies won't go, won't touch. You know, a lot of people will deny climate change, but insurance companies are not in that group because they've got money on the line, and they're, they're full believers, and, uh, and that's the problem. I don't really understand the program fully, but that comes in and it's a government sponsored insurance, flood insurance for properties the insurance companies won't insure. And if they're damaged, I think they get paid back and, and they're allowed to rebuild in the same place. Now that, if that indeed is the case, and I can't say with certainty that it is, that probably needs to be changed that say, if your property is wiped out, we'll reimburse you, but go build someplace else. You can't build in that flood zone any longer. Anyone else? It could be, and like, uh, as you said, like uh, if, we, if we are in a floodplain or something, probably it has been, you know, kind of drifting. Maybe not constricting back in that place would be kind of like tight. But in the coastal areas, particularly, things things get, you know, we get surprises. Yeah, forty years ago, forty years ago, Florida instituted what's called a setback line, because it's mostly sandy coasts, and they're able to probably predict beach erosion for given events pretty well. And so they established this construction setback line. Existing homes were grandfathered in if you were seaward of that line. But if a storm took your house out, you could only rebuild behind that line. Any new construction had to be built behind that line. It was a big political decision. And as you can imagine, there was probably quite a bit of resistance. And it seems that the people who have the nice homes on the coast probably have enough money to influence the political mm -hmm. landscape as well. Mm -hmm. Anyone else in here? Oh, Stephen. Um, well, I suppose another observation. The ability to get coastal projects off the ground, especially coastal development projects, is, is difficult and sometimes rightly so. But one of, the, one of the observations I would make is that the involvement of other um, areas of, uh, of expertise like urban design, landscape, architecture, ecology and what have you is making an enormous difference in that they almost offset some of the issues that you've been talking about and actually take it into a, a different sphere. And they're very important issues because when you go to these meetings, public meetings and the like, it, people are really, they want to know what it looks like, how much the community is going to get out of it and all those sorts of things. So in a, in a way we've sort of been, not hijacked, but the emphasis has gone to other places and probably quite importantly so, but we're sort of, technical matters are taken for granted in a way that, you know, you can solve it, you can get the rock size right, you can you know, <laughs> get the slope right and so on and so forth. But these other things that are becoming more important actually are, are the, bigger, the bigger sales tickets for those particular projects. Yeah. I don't know whether that's what's happened with you guys over there, but that's certainly what my observation here in New Zealand. Yeah. 
Go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, I think it's, it's true, Stephen. I think, um, you know, really, it is about that, you know, vision, and we just get you guys to tell us how to do it. Yeah. That's the engineer's job, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> My experience is sort of boxed in by the Corps of Engineers working for the federal government and that every project had to have a positive cost-benefit ratio. And maybe the economists could, could jinx the numbers a little bit, but, but rather than a, a beach nourishment project that gives a better recreational beach, that doesn't have the cost-benefits. You have to cast it in terms of flood protection. That's what you're providing. And you're protecting this much valuable infrastructure behind the dunes and if you have an extended beach, then that lasts throughout the duration of the storm. And you can cast it in that way. By and large, the majority of the Corps' budget went for navigation channel maintenance, dredging. It's just huge. It's you know $5 billion or something annually or, in, or on a two-year cycle. Uh, the, beach, the beach protection, most of the infrastructure is in place now. And I think that's why we saw sort of a decrease in the laboratory work I was involved in was they didn't need to build any new harbors or new breakwaters. It was mostly going out and repairing the damaged ones or keeping the channel dredged to a deeper depth so they could get bigger ships in or whatnot. But co countries like Mexico, which started uh, the natural gas exporting, uh, they had to have some new harbors built. So there's there's those kinds of projects. Uh, of course, you guys probably need a permanent place to keep the America's Cup, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to touch on the other things you're having, and, and, and what Stephen's talking about, it, the cost-benefit analysis of a beach versus a seawall is quite a, a hard thing to do. It's a, it's a, to put a monetary value on something like a beach is, from my experience, been quite a difficult thing to do. You, know? you can do it in terms of tourist numbers, how much each tourist spends and stuff like that. But, you know, the actual, it's sort of those untangible things like being able to walk along sand as opposed to a bunch of lumpy rocks mm -hmm. is, is something that people, we're still trying to get our heads around. Uh, there's one more question down the back and then we'll wrap it up, eh? Oh, absolutely. Uh, just you have to look no further than the Netherlands. They're, a huge part of their budget goes into their coastal protection. They designed to a, a one in 10,000 year event, which is annual exceedance probability of like 0.001%. Uh, but a good portion of their country is below sea level. And so they're, they're anticipating that. The, the Europeans are on it. Japan has totally armored their coastline, from what I can tell. Uh, Even against tsunamis. Yep. Yep. They, they, what, what was the slide? Something like over $400 billion from the, the tsunami in 2011. Total. Yeah. Yeah. The damage. And then, uh, interestingly enough, you see um, some of those areas where they've almost locked off, the, the communities behind them are sort of getting a sense of being almost imprisoned and wanting that connection back to the coast and almost willing to to take the hit of 2011, yeah. for, you know, for that sense of freedom. And yeah, our, our Colorado beaches are in good shape. <laughs> 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 All right, I think uh, we'll call it quits there. Thank um, you, thank you once again. It's been a real honor. <laughs>